Thank you. Uh, Red May uh, would like to acknowledge that we gather on indigenous land, the traditional territory of Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe. Uh, Red May is a volunteer effort. Uh, we put on 44 events over a whole month. We bring 19, 20 speakers into town, uh, and uh, it could not be done without a lot of people who put a lot of time into it. Uh, events like these take money, and we don't have any. Uh, we have a special uh, uh, method for Red May. We put everything on a credit card at the beginning of the month, and then we <laughs> tell everybody during the month that we have a GoFundMe online called uh, Fan the Flame of Red May. So if you go to that, or to our Red, uh, Red May website, www.redmayseattle.org, you'll find a place to donate. If you like what we do and want us to continue doing it, please uh, give whatever you can spare. We depend on the kindness of strangers like Blanche, du Blanche Dubois did. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy now uh, to uh, continue a discussion that seems to have been going on for several days that started with uh, Nancy Fraser's wonderful Katz lecture on uh, what would socialism be in the 21st century and uh, Baskar, who uh, presented last night at the University Bookstore, talking about his book, The Socialist Manifesto. Uh, these two unlikely protagonists, dare I say an odd couple, if I can make a TV reference, come together in a book called The Old is Dying, The New Cannot Be Born, uh, uh, which uh, started by, with a pamphlet by Nancy, or an article, in uh, what she told me was a right-wing magazine. And uh, then uh, Baskar and Nancy had a conversation about the book. And so taking all these conversations and bringing the confluence of them on stage and letting the introduction of Nancy and Baskar be less of a traditional academic introduction where we list their achievements, but becomes part of the questions that I asked, let's bring Nancy Fraser and Baskar Sukura on stage and I will ask them to introduce themselves when we first start the discussion. So let me, let me frame this in a kind of obvious way. Both of you come from different generations kind of place yourselves in terms of the left, in terms of your uh, growing awareness, in terms of uh, the work you've done and the work you do uh, from where you come from and how these two different generations came together in uh, your dialogue. Should I start? Okay. So I'm a lot older than Baskar. <laughs> we have to start with that. Um, yeah, I'm really a 68er and my radical political activist career begins in the city of Baltimore, where I grew up, in a Jim Crow legally segregated city. And so the struggle for desegregation was the formative experience of my uh, youth. It, it was my own political awakening and uh, when I was in junior high and high school. And I followed a path that was very common in my generation graduating without leaving anything behind from civil rights uh, to anti-Vietnam War, anti-imperialism, uh, to a kind of uh, Marxism, a, a, a new left variant of Marxism that was you know, highly unorthodox, that was uh, very concerned um, initially with, with race and uh, empire, and soon, uh, you know, like everyone else, discovered feminism and uh, so on and so forth. And I was saying to Philip in the car that I don't actually think any of my fundamental ideas have changed very much since those days. Um, I struggled uh, in um, various activist groups in uh, New York City, uh, uh, doing full-time political work, especially around housing, uh, tenants' rights, and rent strikes, and this kind of stuff and eventually um, decided to go to graduate school. Uh, I had to sort of face the um, 
realization that the revolution was not going to happen uh, so quickly and that I needed a sort of longer range game plan. And I became a philosopher. I struggled uh, in graduate school and in my professional life to keep the, uh, the spirit uh, as well as the intellectual aspect of my political commitments alive, uh, sometimes more successfully than others. And I have to say that now I'm feeling very young again because I think we are in a moment of tremendous turmoil and uh, opportunity. And I'm seeing um, people all around me suddenly interested in socialism and in Marxism and in socialist feminism and in eco-Marxism and, and all of this stuff. So um, I think you've, you've already had uh, some events in Red May that um, were devoted to a discussion of the, of the manifesto, the feminist, uh, not, feminism for the 99% manifesto that I co-authored with Chinzira Rutsa and Tithi Bhattacharya. And that, I have to say, was the first piece of truly agitational, propagandistic writing of any extended form that I have done in like 40 years. And boy, did it feel good to really <laughs> say what you think, you know? <laughs> And, um, you know, of course, I've done op-ed pieces here and there, but um, uh, so I feel like, uh, yeah, I'm somehow becoming a, a sort of an activist again. And uh, I do feel that, um, that somehow my life is, you know, somehow coming full circle. I feel like, like, like you know, it's, it's obviously a different time, but I have the same sort of, sort of passion and energy and um, hopes that I had in the, in the 1960s. So, oh, there we go. Our, our, hopes, our hopes have already faded, yeah. Um, so, yeah, my, my story is less interesting because I was born in less interesting political times. You know, I'm, I'm 29 now, and, but when I got first politicized, I think the awakening wasn't really a radical awakening so much as uh, being a good liberal or a good social democrat in that uh, I'm the youngest of five, I'm the only one of my, my siblings born in the United States, um, I got the chance to go to college, most of my, my three older siblings didn't get the chance to go to college, so I saw how much of life were kind of just accidents of birth, and it's pretty hard not to see the way in which having access to good public goods uh, the privileges that come with having a American passport, a million other things, uh, you know, played played a role. And um, I guess I was just a strong defender of the the welfare state. And from that point, I had developed kind of an intellectual interest in Marxism, reading all sorts of you know thinkers from Ralph Miliband to I read uh, when I was like in the eighth grade, I read the three part Deutscher trilogy of, of Trotsky. Uh, you know, things that were, were not a common form of politicization. So I guess you could say there was this organic politicization around, around defending and believing in social goods, uh, goods that in the United States we do have in a sense, but it's very much limited to um, suburbs and other places where property taxes fuel, um, fuel public goods. You know, my parents uh, were clever enough to rent, <laughs> which was kind of was, was a little loophole around that. but. Um, but I saw that, the anti-war movement, so there, there was this organic part of it, but a lot of it was the randomness that comes from kind of middle-class politicization, which is, is, you know, luckily I didn't pick up a book by Anne, uh, you know, Rand or, <laughs> or, or uh, Milton Friedman or something like that first. Um, I actually did. You did? Yeah. <laughs> I had that, that really? Okay. Okay, yeah, I had a syndicalist phase for, for about six months because I was reading about the Spanish Civil War and I was just like, I didn't know what happened. So it was kind of like, the history was very, was very exciting for me at the time until I got to the end and then I saw how depressing everything was. Um, it was like having a very, uh, I have one friend who you know, doesn't follow much history and he was really into the movie Valkyrie because he had no idea uh, Hitler wasn't killed in a coup. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was a that was a reference to a Tom Cruise movie from about 12 years ago. Yeah, figured, figured you know, connect with the kids. <laughs> so, 
Um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of uh, random. What I was trying to do with Jacobin was to take these ideas and keep the flame alive, keep them uh, relevant. Uh, because what I encountered when I first joined the left, and I joined the Democratic Socialists of America when I was 17, so 12 years ago, there's about 5,000 people in the organization. There's uh, you know, a handful of people under 22, 23 in the organization, uh, then a bunch of people over the age of 60. So there's this huge donut hole, there's these lost generations, and uh, part of the Project of Jackman was keeping alive a certain set of ideas, because I believe that the left, the democratic socialist movement in this country, uh, we were defeated, hopefully just temporarily, uh, we weren't wrong. And um, that was one of, the, one of the key purposes. And in my mind, this was a project of renovation, of survival, of, of keeping this, this flame alive, that I thought was gonna last 20, 30 years or something like that until um, it was useful. I actually did, did an interview with New Left Review in 2014 when I said kind of the goal in my life was hopefully by the time I die, meanwhile I was like 23 or 24 when this interview was coming out, there'd be um, you know, a, uh, like a socialist movement that comprises like 5% of the country. I think that's something we could probably achieve in the next five, 10 years now. So obviously things are changing for the, for the better, but part of that conservatism of, of, of you know, low expectations was just the left is so defeated in the United States. So many of the infrastructures, not just intellectually, but even our unions, our political organizations, all these things um, were just completely shattered. We were a completely depoliticized movement, depoliticized uh, country. And I think things are opening up, both in terrifying ways on the, on the right, but also in ways that are, are, are really inspiring. And I think that's what Nancy was, was getting at this, you know, this, this moment. So that was the kind of time for, for action and re-engaging with, with ideas, not for the retreat back into academia, or in our case, into, into theory and other stuff. Like, how do we now make these things relevant once again and accessible to people? So one of the things that fascinated me about this partnership was it brings together uh, two aspects of uh, uh, two aspects that are separated often theory and practice one associates Nancy with uh, well obviously feminist theory but critical theory which was essentially where sort of Western Marxist intellect went for about 30 years and perhaps in some people's mind maybe too long uh, uh, someone once came into a red May uh, thing and said, why does everybody here talk about MCM prime instead of, you know, and so there's that attitude and, and Bhaskar to a certain degree, uh, particularly in, the, in your instructions to writers for your popul for, for, for Jacobin and also for your notion of how an ideal socialist meeting should take place is that someone should walk in off the street and there should be nothing that turns them off and it's something that they can't understand or says this is not for you or this is a part of coterie or I have to learn to say praxis instead of practice you know to be part of this discussion and yet and yet and yet uh, if you look at the program of Red May you can see that it clearly divides between some events that are very, very, are obviously going to draw a larger public, and some other ones, usually under the title of a Marxathon, uh, that will talk about Lukash or uh, the, the uh, immediate process of production or something like that, which sound like inside baseball events. And yet, there's this notion that Cain says is that. Uh, every, even every practical economist is the slave of some dead economist's ideas. So the fact that you are having this partnership is that you're trying to find these, these uh, alternating currents between uh, theory and practice in, in your book and, and in your dialogue. Could you sort of expound on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I have to say how much I admire what Bhaskar has done with Jacobin. Uh, I mean, the, you know, just to have this incredible resource, it has been such a, um, a beacon, uh, you know, for uh, all sorts of young people and others um, who, you know, are really finding their way uh, to left history, to left thinking, to left politics. Um, so I say bravo, and I mean that uh, truly. Um, I guess, you know, again, maybe because of this a question of the long uh, decades that I've lived through, um, I actually think that um, we really need to think historically about the theory-practice um, relationship. 
I, I evoked before the 60s, and the thing that was so enlivening then for me was how easy it was to go back and forth between theory and practice. Everyone was in a reading group, everyone was in the streets, in a consciousness raising group, et cetera, et cetera, and ideas flowed very, very easily between, you know, between people who were writing and people who were marching, and sometimes they were the same people and sometimes not, um, between academia even. Um, and then um, the sort of intervening decades for me were um, decades, I, I don't want to use the word retreat exactly, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I was really doing um, mainly theoretical and academic work. Um, and that's what I could do and could contribute, and especially in that period. Um, but these things, um, I mean, we, I, I think that the word that I really want to use, and this might, um, I'm not sure if we're ag agreeing or not, uh, Bhaskar. I mean, to me, there are, um, there's normal times and there are crisis times. And, er and they're completely different in terms of the tempo of uh, learning and of development. And they're completely different in terms of the relation between theory and practice. So I lived through one crisis moment in which there was a speed up of how fast people learned to think differently and how quickly um, ideas spread and how there wasn't this intimidation of theory because everybody was making theory out of their, their lives. Um, then there was the, the time when you know, er everything you know, kind of got normalized and all sorts of people uh, you know, still cared passionately about uh, certain causes and ideals, but you know, let's say found ways of um, getting into institutions where these ideas could not retain their radical spark. So people were in, you know, ca professional caucuses uh, here or there, whatever. Um, and, and I really do think that we are living in a moment of very deep crisis. I don't just mean an objective system crisis, which is the case, but a lived uh, experience of crisis and therefore of the, um, the absolute necessity to, to put aside the old common sense and to try out new ways of thinking and to have Jacobin there for people to go to, that's so fantastic. And I feel that the, the theoretical work that I do now, I'm finding that it speaks to much broader um, you know, publics than um, it used to. It might be that with age, um, I've sort of gotten past whatever anxieties I had about having to sound smart, and so I'm willing to just talk in a much more you know, colloquial way in my writing and, and so on. But I think this is a moment where the theory practice thing is shifting, and I'm less worried um, uh, about that um, than I would have been 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I well, uh, I was, I'm gonna butcher the quote, and maybe this is an inappropriate setting to be quoting Lenin, but Lenin has a quote that's like, there are, oh wow, I completely forgot the quote, but it, it get, the, the, <laughs> the gist of it was, you know, there are, uh, you know, um, you know, months, weeks and months where it seems like, you know, uh, the amount of history that happens is like years and decades, and then there's also the reverse. There's entire years, years that, that pass where nothing really happens. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure what era are we, we living in. I think we're living in, in an era where, where there is this crisis of the neoliberal uh, model, but more importantly, there's this looming crisis. And it seems like this crisis of the neoliberal model is in many ways, at least in the United States, I think, potentially benefiting the left. You know, Trump squeaked by with his minoritarian coalition uh, as Nancy kind of explains in the book, there's reasons to be afraid of Trumpism, especially if we continue to put up people like Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden against, against uh, Trump, in that maybe Trump is so odious that people won't vote for him in particular, but 
are we really repudiating right populism if we're not proposing actual alternatives to it? But it does seem like we're gaining ground. Uh, something like 70% of Americans now support Medicare for all, including close to a majority of Republicans even. There's widespread support for the jobs guarantee. In poorer states like Mississippi, the support is over 70% for the jobs guarantee. Like that pretty much uh, corresponds to the most vulgar Marxist uh, you know, analysis. People who are poorer and need more jobs are going to support the demand for more jobs, right? It's it kind of, uh, that's, that's a, a relief. But we have this looming crisis of climate change, which is going to speed things up even more, but in a way that probably benefits the right. Because we benefit from the idea that there's enough to go around. That in fact, we're living in these wealthy, abundant societies, and people are working hard to contribute to these, these societies, and they deserve more. You know, nobody, as the common refrain kind of goes, like nobody deserves to uh, be living in poverty if, they, if they're working a full-time job. Nobody deserves to be homeless amid vacant apartments and these luxury constructions uh, you know, going up. This is a common sense, but the common sense doesn't hold if people feel like that there's, there's scarcity and these flows of climate refugees are, are potentially jeopardizing your own well-being and whatever else. So, um, I think there's reasons to be optimistic for the next 10, 15, 20 years. I think there's reasons that we might uh, see in the future a, another uh, crisis, another great speed up, but one that benefits the forces of, of scarcity. Because right now, the right has been making its hay off what's fundamentally a false scarcity. Um, you know, the idea that there isn't enough to go around, the idea that it's a zero-sum game and that People coming here to work and live and contribute to society are, in fact, taking away from a society. But what happens when there's 100 million refugees from Bangladesh flooding into central, um, central India, um, into, into other poor, poor areas? Uh, if we have Hindu nationalism in India now, what would be the, the result there? So I, I think that I'm both very optimistic in the, the short term, but I feel like if we lose this moment, we might look back, uh, and if we do fail to act on climate change, we might look back at this moment the way that um, past generations look back, and I hate to be so hyperbolic, but look back at the 1910s and, and, and the 1920s. In many places, these, these were great periods of working class advance. Um, you know, you have obviously the Russian Revolution, but you also have uh, labor and social democratic parties in Western Europe taking power for the first time. You have radical movements for, for democratization in, in, in parts of the world that, that, that were still autocratic countries. You had the fall of monarchies. You had, even in, in Germany, we think of uh, Weimar as a, as a disaster. Of course, it's not the solution that maybe Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht wanted, but it was still a, a republic governed by social democrats in a land that was just a right-wing monarchy. Um, you know, these were moments of great, great hope and optimism, and then it, uh, you know, it seemed like the future belonged to, to progress and modernity and, and, and broadly uh, a working class movement, or at least kind of a force of the enlightenment. And regardless of what, it, what, what we think about the authoritarianism that was represented by, by what the Soviet Union became, you know, the, the Soviet Union, at least in theory, re represented something quite different than, than the authoritarianism of the, the right. So I, I guess for me, it, it's can we take advantage of this opportunity because I think the real speed up will happen if we fail. And I, I'm both, I, I'm, I vacillate between being excessively optimistic and excessively pessimistic. So the name Gramsci circulates in this book, around this book, in the presidential campaign. Uh, maybe some people know this here, but Pete Buttigieg, the candidate is the son of the translator of Gramsci's prison writings that Columbia puts out, that the three-volume translation. That's the best is action. it Buttigieg? Uh, yeah, I think you got it. No, what? I, 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 know, I knew the father very well. Okay. So how do you pronounce it? Buddha is how he Buddha Okay. Even though he seems less a Gramscian than one of those uh, Italian wheeler dealers, gelati liberals at the time, who were keeping things uh, going, but. Uh, uh, this notion of living in an interregnum, yeah. the idea that you're caught between two reigns, one that sort of hasn't finished but is dying, and the other one that's coming, it, 
What do you think is dying now? I mean, it's obvious that the centrist Democrats are simply a bunch of cadavers that, you know, that, that when they bring out uh, Biden to run, I mean, literally, he even looks like a cadaver. The ideas are cadaverous. You know, as I said, they fall, they fall asleep at night and they, they come up, wake up in the morning and think they have a new idea and it's one they had last week, which they've forgotten about. I mean, it's really, you know, it's, there's no way it can connect to anybody. And yet, you know, the, the good ideas that are coming in don't seem to have vehicles yet to uh, propel them forward, except people like Sanders, who are at least the point where democratic energy, democratic and socialist energies enter the political sphere, which of course we're going to try to make uh, extend as far as it can at this particular juncture. Um, how can Gramsci, what, uh, you talked about good sense and co common sense, for example. Gramsci uh, talks about the fact that uh, we need to try to find the good sense in common sense. In other words, take the stories that people always believe, but try to subtract the ones that are idiotic, like uh, you don't, you're don't, you not successful, you didn't deserve it because you, know, you didn't work hard enough or whatever, and find out what they already believe and extend that into making a new narrative that can become hegemonic. What do you see as the good sense in what people already believe that can be woven into a kind of a new story that, that has some, uh, that can at least contest the story that government is not the problem, is the it's problem not the solution, that taxes are takings, uh, and so forth, you know. So, I mean, first of all, I want to just say something about this interregnum uh, idea. Mm -hmm. um, this is um, very much the way I think about history. I think about history as um, basically having, or, or let's say the history of capitalism. I think of the history of capitalism as a succession of different forms of capitalism, all of which are facing these deep-seated underlying tensions and contradictions that are, are absolutely built in and inherent in any form of capitalism, and these these periods in which a form of capitalism sort of stabilizes more or less and manages to defuse or at least soften the contradictions that are there. And, but these periods are punctuated by crisis periods, by interregna, by these moments where things unravel and where the reigning common sense starts to break down. Um, and I think that these are periods of tremendous volatility in which people don't any longer believe the reigning common sense. So this um, statistic that Bhaskar just quoted about uh, Mississippi, 70% of the people want a, a, a jobs, a guaranteed jobs program, um, this is a kind of a, a, a breakthrough, let's say, of an earlier common sense in which the people believed that um, if, you know, if somebody didn't have a job, it was because there was something wrong with them. They were too lazy, they were too uppity, they were too you know, uh, graspy and, and not content to take the very low, bad conditions that they... I think that nobody believes in trickle-down anymore. Nobody believes that it, the richer Jeff Bezos gets, the better off we're all gonna be. Nobody believes uh, in the sort of um, free trade uh, ideology that, um, of, of course, has nothing to do with actual fair trade. Um, I, I think there has been a breakdown in, in common sense. And basically what comes through is the ability, which is very rare in American history, to start to think structurally to start to think, no, it's not my fault that I'm not making it. And um, I also think that um, you see moments where things that people know and have probably known for a long time find a way of percolating up and being voiceable. I'll tell you the, the, um, the, the word that I think is so powerful that Sanders used in 2016 and that Trump then copied is the word rigged. It's such a simple word. It's the system is rigged. The economic system is rigged. The political system is rigged. Everybody knew that somewhere deep down. 
but it's like, you know, the, suddenly someone says the emperor doesn't have clothes. And so I, I think there must be a lot of this kind of good sense there. What happens in the kind of period we're in now, which is an interregnum, is uh, that things like that can be said and they get uptake. Now, because as I say, Trump found that word very useful for his own purposes and, and fake news was another one that he turned around masterfully. Um, you know, the, the, it, 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 there's no guarantee about what happens, whether that little crystal of good sense gets articulated in some, you know, very authoritarian, ethno, uh, race, racist, or uh, white supremacist way, or whatever, or in some other way. Um, but, but this is what I mean about the volatility. I think we're in a moment in which people um, are really looking for a new way to think, a new way to understand. The old uh, formulae don't work, and they're looking for new political organizations, new political leaders, new political perspectives. Um, so you see people who will um, vote in 2012 for Obama when he's talking change talk, and they'll vote uh, in uh, 2016 for Bernie, and then they'll vote in, in the presidential, in, in the general election for Trump. Or if they're in France, they'll vote in round one for Mélenchon of the far left and then Le Pen uh, from the National Front. Or, or all of this kind of stuff, they'll, they'll, they'll vote for Brexit and then you know, support Corbyn. So this is, uh, people, it, it's a time of tremendous turmoil. This is an opportunity, and I, here I want to underline um, an agreement with Bhaskar that um, the, the point is that um, if you t take Joe Biden or the cadaver or, or, or whatever, you are just um, basically letting the hunger for change be, you know, satisfied by the right. That's the only thing that can quench that thirst. But what brought that thirst about? The whole preceding, right, decades of, of Clintonism, of Goldman Sachsification, of all of that. Uh, and you, you go back to that, restore the status quo ante, that's just tightening the screw further and leading to more Trumps, worse Trumps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this is not a moment to scurry uh, and, and try to seek protection behind the skirts of, of the liberals who claim to be the protectors but are really the predators. It's a moment to really go to the left. Yeah. So I'll give you a lead in here. Nancy says, yeah, I think it's it. Nancy says people are hungering for something new. So your job in Jacobin is to persuade them that socialism is something new right. and not something old that didn't work, that's cadaverous in its own way. How do you do that? <laughs> well, I think a lot of what we do speaks to people's common sense in that uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to create a new common sense in any kind of Gramscian sense. Uh, oh, why am I saying sense so much? Um, what it, what it does is, is, I think, the core of our, our popular message to people is that it's not your fault, and that's a very powerful and simple message. Americans have been taught that all the problems facing them are the result of some sort of personal failing. If you have medical debt, maybe you, know, you should, should have eaten healthier or you know, practiced yoga or you know, kombucha, whatever that is. I, I haven't had it yet, but you know, I, I hear it's good. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I think telling people that, listen, you're doing the best you can, you're following the rules, you're working hard, you're trying to look after yourself and your, your family, you're trying to, to do good things in civic life, look what happens after Hurricane Katrina, look what happens after every disaster, the people donating blood, the people donating their money, or the people who, who don't benefit from tax write-offs. 
Um, so to tell people that in fact, generally you're being virtuous and you're doing what you, what you can and the reason why you're, you're getting behind, you're still failing is because there are people benefiting from the precarious, shitty situation you're in and those people in, in the language of Sanders is millionaires and billionaires and not minorities and immigrants and in fact, we could take on these people and find social solutions to many of the problems that you're facing. We can't solve all your problems. We can't solve your, your heartbreak at some level. You know, we, we can't, but we can make sure that you can see a doctor without, without worry. We can make sure that you have these, these certain things. So I think the people saying it's not your fault will always have an easier, um, an easier uh, case than the people saying that, you know, this is some sort of individual failing. And it's not just among liberals. It's also among a lot of conservatives, especially some of these anti-Trump conservatives. Like if you read National Review and the way uh, the reviews of Hillbilly Elegy and these other books in National Review, or even Hillbilly Elegy itself, you see the kind of vitriolic hate that's directed at, at, at um, you know, white, poor, and working class people too. A lot of the cultural poverty tropes that were uh, perfected and still are um, lobbed constantly against black Americans are now also being used to some of the most uh, de-invested and devastated um, predominantly white um, you know, working class areas in, this, in this, this country. So I think our message is it's not your fault and our message to, to our audience, which, which isn't what it should be. I mean, we, uh, I, uh, I really do appreciate um, your, your praise, but with Jacobin, we're reaching, let's say you're the rest of the largest Marxist outlets in the US were reaching 10, 20,000 people. We're reaching like a million, which is pretty good. But Breitbart and these other venues are reaching 20, 30, 40 million people. Wow. So, so our core though is to tell people that there's all these injustices and the system is unjust. That's like point one. And our, our, our other premise, and this is the hardest part to break through, is saying there is an alternative. And I think we've convince people, not we, but like the, the movement as a whole, convince people that there are some reforms that are, are viable and possible. I think we need to eventually go further and say, it's not just these reforms, but in fact, we can replace the system as a whole and govern society on a different basis with a different logic. I think that's maybe a struggle for, for the decades to, uh, to come, but, but uh, you know, uh, at core, our message has to be simple enough um, and repetitive enough, and that's been the, the glory of a lot of what we've seen with the support for, for Sanders, is that he's been saying the same damn thing since 1970. He has the most simplistic vocabulary of any presidential candidate, more simplistic than Trump. It's repetitive. If you go to his, um, his rallies, uh, he doesn't even have to speak the end of his words, because he's people, it's like, a, it's like a concert, shut up and pay, play the hits, you know, people just <laughs> are finishing his sentences. I think that's a good thing, and it's not, demagoguery if it's right. <laughs> so let, let's, talk about, let's talk about the idea of uh, destroying, destroying the notion of meritocracy, which is like the fundamental, it, it, it's in every one of Obama's sermons. Uh, you can believe that the system is rigged, uh, but not even question why, for example, basic rights of shelter or, or uh, food should be, should be subject to competition where the winners, even if they start at the same starting line, get to eat and the other ones don't. Uh, but somehow that's sunk in uh, very, very deeply because of 40 years of neoliberal rationality, where the notion of competition all the way down is supposed to bring out the best in everything. Uh, there's a book, which you probably all know by Jennifer Silva, called Coming Up Short, where she basically uh, interviews uh, the uh, children of working class families, all of whom lost their good, stable jobs at auto companies and manufacturing jobs, and who haven't been able to make a go of it, and yet they all blame themselves without exception. They, didn't they weren't paying attention in class. They didn't take enough, uh, when they got home, they didn't take enough skill type courses to make them better for the employment market, you know, and, or, or they took opioids or whatever, you know. And it's very, very hard to even get out of that. How do we, how do we deep six meritocracy forever and, and take it away from, uh, the, take competition away from things that shouldn't be competed for, but should, should just be given, should be gifts? Well, first of all, I'm really glad you um, brought up meritocracy because that's the other side of the self-blame. It's that those who, 
who end up uh, unemployed or uh, poor uh, lack the merit. And the other side of that is that those who are in the corporate boardroom deserve it right. because they are the, the, the meritorious ones. Unfortunately, um, meritocracy, uh, I think, had became the sort of default view of what equality meant for most of the, what we, you know, the, the, the social movements, or at least the mainstream currents of the social movements in this country. And I'm thinking of liberal feminism and liberal anti-racism and the sort of uh, conventional centrist wing of uh, the LGBTQ movements and so on. Um, I think that we somehow lost um, our sense of what actual social equality means and what it requires and, and think that um, you know, it's good enough if women of the professional managerial class can achieve the same positions and pay as the men of their own class. That's sort of basically this degeneration. Uh, and, and this has to do with the long-standing culture of individualism and volunteerism uh, of the United States, which is, I think, we're a bit extreme compared to many other countries for whom the experience of thinking structurally rather than you, you either deserve or you, you don't, you're deserving or undeserving, it, it, com it comes easier in other places. So I, um, I definitely think that whatever um, um, socialism means, and it's obviously a contested term, and I don't think we can fall back on received understandings of it. I think we have to invent versions of it that are eco-socialist and feminist socialist and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, whatever it means, it certainly means that a, a very substantial set of goods that are, let's say, use values that satisfy people's basic needs cannot be commodities. They cannot be things that we have to have cash income to pay for. So I'm talking about an enormous expansion of what of public goods uh, in terms of housing, in terms of food, in terms of transportation, uh, in terms of uh, you know education, health care, shelter, all, all of these things uh, that are you know the sort of fundamental baseline of what you need to live a decent life, I believe they should all be completely decommodified. I don't think we should have private schools that people can pay for and opt out. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go very far and, and not worry about the quote unquote uh, restraint on liberty when you don't allow people to buy things that are better than what other people get. Maybe we should start by asking our legislators and presidents that their kids have to attend public schools, right. that they have to have the same health care that all the American people have, right. and so forth, to make them less aristocrats right. and give them an incentive to make things better. But I'm Beskar, for that. I'm for that. you can see I'm obsessed with yeah, that. I keep, yeah, yeah. I keep coming back to that. Okay. No, no, that's 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 that's. You know, you should be a ho you should be a talk show host. You really lost your calling. You're, I, I'm in I'm in awe of, of of how good your transitions are. They're seamless. Um, so, you know, I I do think that that um, the reason why there's this individualism in the U.S. I think has less to do with with our, our deep the deep history of the U.S. as a, as a settler colonial nation or all these other things. It has more to do with the recent history of just not having a strong labor movement not having strong left-wing political parties. So in other words, we haven't actually presented people with collective solutions, a, co a collective um, kind of action as a viable choice. So of course, the way they're gonna survive is by individual gumption initiative, whatever else, asking your friends and family for support. If you're in a uh, area with very high unemployment, you're, um, and you find out that your, your hours just got cut at your job by one third, you know, what, are you gonna go meet up with your coworkers and try to go on strike? No, you're probably just gonna be grateful you have a job and you're gonna maybe drive an Uber or a Lyft in, in your extra few hours and you might ask your friends and family for support. 
I think a lot of the goal of the left is creating the infrastructures, rebuilding the labor movement, creating these, these civic spaces uh, that can actually make collective solutions a more viable choice. Uh, I have um, a, like a little, like that app Evernote. I have this little folder in my, my, my Evernote where I, where I save clippings. And one of them is uh, a clipping about Confucianism and capitalism and Confucianism and communism. So in my book, there's a chapter on the Chinese uh, revolution. Um, and I kind of saw a bunch of these old articles that tried to explain the rise of Chinese communism and its durability in the 50s and 60s with the inherent characteristics of Confucianism and other kind of traditions. So like, oh, well, it's very natural that the Chinese would cling to this collectivism because, you know, there's this and this inheritance. Uh, then I, I found a bunch of other clippings from the 90s and 2000s, like Thomas Friedman essaying, saying the exact opposite. Oh, well, you know, the Confucian thing is really propelling the Chinese people forward. If only the Indians had some Confucianism. So I, I, think, I think like a lot of these ideologies, a lot of these things are quite uh, malleable. And we shouldn't underestimate the role of, of politics uh, in creating solidarities and creating identities. Um, you know, Sweden, was considered the most barbaric and unequal uh, country in Europe, uh, short of uh, Russia. And there's, there's these old kind of quotes to that, that effect in terms of the, the inequality, the violence, whatever else. There's one reason why, that's one reason why the temperance movement was so strong in, in these areas, because they were kind of seen as, as um, you know, predatory, difficult areas. And a lot of the, the feminist and working class movements of the time, I thought temperance was one of the solutions to it. Uh, to this day, if you meet a Swedish social democrat who's kind of on a junket or something, um, the young Swedish social democrats often don't drink. That's how you identify the careerists among them. Uh -huh. the, the ones that go left will we'll have a bear with you often. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I think that the goal is to uh, build these institutions that eventually I think will still have notions and rhetoric of, of freedom. I think freedom is at the core of the, the socialist I ideal, but the freedom that we want isn't a freedom to exploit others. We don't want a society in which success is essentially behaving like a sociopath and, and making profits by any means necessary and, and, and whatever else. But we, we want the notion of freedom that, I guess there's a, there's a German, um, uh, like their, their famous labor anthem, the United Front song, which is like their version of solidarity uh, forever, but much better um, in terms of its, its lyrics. And I won't um, try to say the, say the German, but the rough translation of one of the lyrics is, um, you know, we want no masters over us and, and no servants underfoot. And I think that's the core of the socialist ideal. We want freedom, we want autonomy. Uh, we want the basis for that freedom and autonomy but it's not freedom to exploit others, but it's also just freedom from exploitation. And that's, that's, that's the kind of, uh, yeah, I think, very American rhetoric that we could, we could push in the future. So let me close with a, uh, I will come up with a bleak vision of the future, and I want you each to come up with a hopeful vision. Okay. <laughs> so let's start with the bleak vision. Uh, Habermas said, I think, in the 70s that, uh, capitalism needs two things. It needs to accumulate, accumulation, and it needs legitimation. And he talked about there being a legitimation crisis in the 60s, because of course it didn't seem that there were any problems with accumulation, uh, not foreseeing what would happen in 2008 or even before that. Uh, but one can ask the question, how important, we we've talked about how the hegemonic, he he hegemonic story is sort of dissolved. Nobody believes these things in anymore. But what if legitimation has ceased being so important as it was for capitalism in the golden age? What if the instruments of repression have become so powerful now in terms of uh, the, the way uh, there's a kind of a global counterinsurgency against any political movement that starts to democratically occupy the streets? And what if the people who used to grant some kind of crumbs so that at least capitalism would be accepted by many people 
uh, are now thinking about flying to Mars or uh, moving to New Zealand behind gated compounds? What uh, is going to stop us from it dissolving into some kind of neo-feudalism where the rich just leave us behind, not even trying to legitimate or make the system work, and leaving us outside uh, Elysium in the, the kind of precarious places and hot zones of the world trying to fend for ourselves? That's the bleak vision. Now give us a hopeful one. So, uh, first of all, um, I mean, just on this issue about legitimation, um, you know, the, what Habermas was really talking about social democratic capitalism or state managed capitalism in which states were taking on new expanded responsibilities for keeping, avoiding dangerous boom bust cycles right. and, and, uh, and for also keeping the working class, giving it a stake in the system for you know, co-opting a uh, revolution. So um, it's because governments were expected to do more that governments needed legitimation. And then the question is, if, they, if what they're doing didn't work, then people throw them out. Now, the, the interesting thing about our form of capitalism, neoliberalism, and this is a question, um, do people still expect more from their governments, or have they bought the story that the market is the, is the way to go? I mean, in, in environmentalism, uh, lots of people think, oh, we, we just need carbon trading. We don't need like carbon taxes or these coercive things that governments do. So we have a different problem than, it, uh, than legitimation. Legitimation can become a problem if people already expect more from government and then it doesn't deliver. But if we've gotten to the point where lots of people just don't even have the, the memory, the historical memory of, of having those expectations, then we're in a different ballgame. And I think the scenario that you described is an absolutely possible scenario. I think that if there is no, I mean, let me, let me put it this way. I could see uh, three possible scenarios developing. One is, the, is, the, is yours, and that is a just some kind of truly regressive, you know, deeply uh, violent, uh, repressive, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you could call it barbaric, feudal, whatever. That, that is a real possibility, there's no question. Another possibility, and this I'm really agnostic about, is whether capitalism is capable of reinventing itself in some new way that at least provisionally for a number of decades, you know, puts itself together again, as it did in the 1930s or in the post-war period, New Deal. Is there some new thing that they can dream up? And I have to say that um, you, you can't give a, a fast answer to that question because um, capitalism has proved tremendously creative in its history. Uh, it has reinvented itself time and again. It solves one problem, and, and of course then it, it brings about another one, and then somehow miraculously it seems to solve that problem. This doesn't help the people on the short end of the stick, but it, it actually keeps uh, things going. So I can't rule that out. The third possibility, though, is the one that, that we want, and that is a genuinely post-capitalist or socialist society. And I think I might have a slightly different time frame in mind than Bhaskar does. Um, I, I think that, um, because I think we are in what, what historians would call a general crisis, it's not just an economic crisis, it's not just a legitimation crisis, it's not just an ecological, but it's a sense in which the whole social order is unraveling and all of these various forms of crisis accumulate and, and converge and overdetermine one another. So I think if there's going to be a transition to socialism, that it's not going to be something that goes slowly by gradually winning more and more people over the next 50 years or something. I think we've got a window now of, I don't know, you know look, crises can, can fester for a long time before they get resolved. 
But I, I sort of feel that, that you know, it's not a, a long window. Um, I'm looking for um, a, a genuinely revolutionary situation uh, to develop. I think uh, no one can predict this, but um, I think that we're talking about seizing control over the social surplus that capital is uh, constantly uh, praising itself for generating, and even Marx praised it for generating. I think we're talking about a, a really redesigned relationship to nature, a redesigned relationship between economic production and social reproduction. A re I think we're talking about deeply extending what we mean by democracy for, uh, and getting it out of some little thing called the political sphere where you know, all sorts of major questions are already off the agenda. And so this is a, a major revision of the, the basic shape of the social order. And um, I, I don't want to uh, wait and see if capitalism can figure out some solution, because the barbarism threat is real. Yeah. So maybe it's socialism or, or new capitalism or, or barbarism instead of the old just the two. But still, um, the clock is ticking. Baskar, yeah. give us your... Uh, well, well, I would say the optimistic um, you know, part is just we are living in a world that has been, it's not the worst of all possible worlds. It's been tamed and it's been influenced by self-conscious uh, interests in the, uh, movements in the interests of the vast majority. Um, the last 150, 160 years of the workers' movement has not just been a litany of defeat. Um, God, if you believe in God, um, rested on the seventh day. Uh, we hit the sixth off, and that's because of the labor movement. Uh, there's been profound limits that have been placed on the ability of capitalism to exploit. When the labor movement was first formed, you had child labor, you had no restrictions. Our, our, the great rallying cry uh, of the martyrs of Haymarket and later that inspired the, the creation of these, the Second International, the, these first mass workers party, was around the eight hour day. Obviously we're seeing some of these gains erode, but it does us no good to say that they didn't exist. Um, we are living in societies that have been fundamentally humanized by the efforts of the labor movement, by the efforts of, of, of communist, socialist, and social democratic parties, by the efforts of feminist movements and anti-racist movements. Uh, we're living, uh, I think, amid not just our defeats, but also our, our victories. And that should inspire us to demand deeper and more profound changes, uh, but I think we have to keep that um, in mind. Now, I think all the, the changes, the, the kind of new dynamics in capitalism that arose in the post-war period, even with, with these, these other programs like the New Deal, they emerged because of the, the threat that came from labor and because of the, the self-conscious organizing of labor. In some cases, the welfare state wasn't constructed by capitalists. It was constructed uh, in spite of the resistance of capitalists uh, by social democratic parties. In other cases, just the influence of left movements uh, changed the way ruling parties operated. So whereas before the German ruling class used to govern with, with monarchs and, and with, with uh, you know, generals, uh, by the post-war period, the German ruling class was, was under pressure Christian Democrats. They were, they were kind of centrist, trying to create a welfare state and whatnot. So I think if there is going to be a reinvention uh, of capital. If capital is going to be able to at least accede to some of our demands, it'll be kind of a, a, a threat because um, uh, there's, there's no, nothing that, that capital would have, would have gave us without, without us, us demanding it. Uh, there's no such thing. I hate when, when uh, Leninists often talk about, uh, or they used to in the, the old generations. I, I haven't actually encountered this that much. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, the, the term bourgeois democracy or bourgeois democratic rights as if there's such a thing, as if they ever wanted poor people to be able to, to vote. Um, and I think what we, we found when we look at the history of working class politics is that people don't get more radical when things get worse. People get more radical when they see some, some gains. You know, we need to reject the vulture theory of socialism, the idea that, 
that we just need to wait for, for collapse. In fact, I think when people get something like Medicare for all, they'll start asking, why aren't these other necessities decommodified? I think, I think that'll be the starting point. If we can't fight for something and win something like Medicare for all, we can't put broader questions of worker ownership and things like that on the, on the table. So I think there's plenty of reasons to be optimistic about the capacity of people to unite together to fight for something better. But we have to keep in mind that the reason why capitalism is so stable is because all of us are embedded in this system and we all need capital. Capital needs us, but we need capital too. And it's a dependency, but it's an asymmetrical dependency. All of you need your jobs more than your individual boss needs your individual labor. That's why we need to band together collectively to figure out how can we collectively withdraw our labor power? How could we collectively create disruptions so it becomes more rational for capital to agree to environmental legislation? Because it's a lot better to have you know, a, a carbon tax than to have you know, production halted and, and disruptions on the street and whatever, whatever else. But I, I do, I guess, the, the, the thing that I cling to is less the old Marxist belief in the inevitability of change moving in our direction and so on, but I cling to the idea of of people being inherently rational, at the very least, not at the very least, people do not um, choose uh, routes that will endanger themselves and their 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 loved one. We know when we're exploited, and we know when we're oppressed, and when given a better option, we'll always choose that option. Um, when you have in, you know, in the in the 60s and 70s. When, when um, there was, for the first time, mass uh, female participation in the, the labor force, and women were given access to, to strong jobs and economic security, at least relative to what, what was there in the, the, the past, uh, you had in, an increase in divorce rates. That wasn't because of just the influence of feminism, just the influence of, of leftist ideology. It was because people now had the ability to leave bad situations and they now had the independence to do so. I imagine we might see the same thing if there was Medicare for all and people weren't tied to their spouse's uh, health insurance you know, policies and things like that. That to me is proof. You know, people are, 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 are capable of choosing uh, the options once we present them. And, 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 our, and our goal is, as leftists, I think, is to create the infrastructures of dissent that make collective action a more viable choice for, for people. Thanks very much. Let's get it on him. Uh, so, so questions from the audience. Uh, we will, uh, I guess, line up and come up here. And uh, yes, uh, we'll we ask are. In order. Uh, yeah, I'm Shane. I'm from Town Hall. We are doing an audio recording of this this evening. So, if you don't mind coming up to the microphone and asking your question, not only so everybody can hear it, but also so that we can. Um, get that on our recording this evening. So feel free to line up behind me and we'll try to get through everybody. Ah, I see people wending their way up to the microphone. There we go. Uh, would you say your name and Hi, uh, my name is Yuen Kang Yang. I'm a student from University of Washington, and I study uh, right-wing media in the United States. Um, so I have a question for uh, uh, three of you. Um, so you talked about um, the political solution to many problems that capitalism created. I think um, both speakers talked about um, um, empowering ourselves by uh, engaging in collective action or forming collectives. Um, I wonder how much of this political solution is solved, uh, is, is in a, within a na national bound or it is on a global scale. Uh, well, for one is because the expropriation, or well, capitalism's expropriation and exploitation sometimes um, happens in the global south along the racial lines, um, et cetera. And it seems to me that it's very much a global problem. And the other issue is uh, Professor Nancy Fraser talked about it the other night, that um, maybe we should have a democratic control over how we use uh, surplus value. 
um, that business created in the United States. But still, um, there is a lot of globalization you know, going on, and um, there are, of course, many other more business-friendly countries if this political solution uh, comes true in the United States, business may just move outside to, to other countries. So that could be a problem. So I wonder, uh, do you have any ideas in mind that is there any viable global solution or mechanisms uh, to solve this systematic crisis created by capitalism? Right, that's a very good question. The notion of the unequal scale at which capital operates compared to movements which are all rooted in specific communities or countries. What do you think? Yeah, well, well I, I think it makes sense to, to, the reason why we organize the level of the nation state isn't because we love the nation states, because these are actually where we have democratic inputs. Um, and this is where we can actually influence and, and make, make certain demands. Uh, when it comes to capital flight, I actually don't think it's going to be a huge, that's, I don't think that's going to be the problem in the United States. The United States is such a huge country, it could basically operate as almost a closed economy. Um, not that we would, we would really want that kind of bunker socialism. Um, and I think the real threat is that capital will withhold investment until there's more favorable conditions, not necessarily flee if that, that makes sense. Um, and that's one of the reasons why social democracy has always proved itself to be quite unstable in the long run. So if we look at what happened in a lot of countries in the 60s and 70s, it was capital and labor are kind of no longer having the class compromise that existed in the post-war period under these exceptional position. So social democracy, these, these reforms, these changes, both empowered labor to make more radical demands and start demanding higher wages and things like that. But it ultimately left the levers of control in the hands of capital. And eventually, once labor went too far or once the global conditions changed, like with the increasing internationalization of the economy in the 70s, with the OPEC shock, with uh, wage demand squeezing into profits, capital was able to just say, you know what, that arrangement that was working for us in the past is no longer working for us today and we're going to just no longer invest, or in some countries, we're gonna flee and go to another country. And that's one reason why we need to think about how do we socialize um, um, production? Uh, how do we, in other words, take over private firms and turn them into cooperatives? If it's a worker-owned cooperative, you're not gonna flee. You know, if you, it's actually rooted, uh, you, you, capital flight wouldn't be a problem if we had public financing of new firm construction on a per capita basis, and if we had worker-owned, uh, worker-controlled uh, firms that, that are uh, where citizens who live in an area are, 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 running, are running the firm. So I think that's ultimately why we need to go beyond social democracy and into some sort of um, socialism. But even though I believe in, in kind of going, thinking very globally and very uh, broadly, the reason why a lot of our demands are centered around the nation state is just because you know, there's actually a Congress and there's, local, you know, there's actually ways in which we could make these changes. And often when we talk about internationalism, it becomes a very, it's an important thing, but it comes a very vague and just rhetorical thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I, um, I, I very much um, agree that um, where you have public powers to, who, to whom you can address your claims and if you're lucky and, and skillful in how you do it and build a powerful constituency, get a response, that is definitely uh, in the existing uh, po bounded political communities, territorially based com communities that we call uh, nation states. But um, the fact is there is, are problems at a scale that far exceed the capacities of any territorial bounded state, including a very powerful one like this one. Uh, this is obviously the case for climate change. It's obviously the case for the, the financial speculation, these huge flows of, 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 of capital sloshing around the world that, that are out of control. In, in general, um, what, what some people call um, these huge mega corporations with global reach, they are bigger and more powerful than two thirds of the world's government. It's not possible to actually rein them in with the existing political structure. So we have not only to democratize existing 
political powers. We have to create new public powers at a much larger scale than now exist. So it's not, I don't think of socialist internationalism as um, simply e the socialist movement in each country wins power and they are solidaristic with one another and they cooperate to block the race to the bottom and all of that. I think that there, are, are, uh, there is a need for additional levels of public power that we now have. I'm not talking about just you know, dissolve everything into one big world state. But uh, because there are, obviously we have federalism, we have cities, we have what we call states, we have the federal government, you, you know, you can have lots of different levels. But there's no, socialism in one country does, is completely impossible, that much is very clear. But socialism in a lot of bunch of side-by-side -side countries isn't possible either. Having said that, um, I'm all for full-throated engagement and st struggle over political power wherever you are, including at the national level. In a country like this, uh, the president, if the, every four-year presidential election campaign is one of the few times that we have to have an actual national conversation about who we are and what we're doing and what we want to be. And so socialists need to participate there for sure. Um, but um, but we, we have to always be thinking at the same time, not just about solidarity with us. Oh, here's what I wanted to say. Um, don't underestimate um, what it would mean to bring even a quasi or proto-socialist government to power in this country. This country is the linchpin for a hell of a lot of bad stuff going down. And um, you know the, the ripple effects from a big change in the United States would be enormous, enormous. So I wanted to uh, take a different tack, which is talk, talking about the scale of protest. Uh, start with the WTO. What was very interesting about that is it wasn't just people in Seattle who were protesting. They came from around the world. Uh, I marched beside some members of the French CGT, the Communist Union, who were wearing leather jackets, <laughs> and also some French uh, farmers. It was great, you know, I mean, aside from the turtles. And uh, it totally stunned. The, the, the people of Maryland, uh, Madeleine Albright was on the prone screaming at Paul Schell, the mayor, call out the National Guard, you know, and to his credit, he didn't do it. But, uh, and so there were uh, extreme reactions as how to limit protest. But when I sat at the, was at the Amazon protest during the head tax period, which Shama led, and I saw we were all people from Seattle, I thought we need Amazon is a worldwide co corporation. It e exemplifies almost everything that's bad about the new form of capitalism. And we need to bring the world into Seattle to Amazon to have another WTO where people from around the world uh, admittedly could stage something like a general strike, which given the climate of nationalism, uh, a very good chance of it being very bloody, but nevertheless something that has to, Global labor has to uh, manifest itself against global capital. It can't be national labor uh, demonstrating always against global capital. We have to find ways for global labor to do it, is, is my thought. So maybe we should take like three? Yeah. Or, uh, Let's take three questions at a time. That's yeah. Sure. Um, hey, my name's uh, Will McKeith, and I teach at UW. And I, I think my question is, I'm just, I was listening to this, I was thinking about my experiences teaching, and I think it's a question about like teaching and political education and strategy within an inter interregnum. So I teach the globalization class um, at a couple different UW campuses before, and it was a class that was designed by someone very much about the rise of neoliberal thinking in the US and how it spread globally, and it was designed before 2016. And when I took that syllabus and taught it post-Trump, all of my students were like, what are you talking about? Like, just so, I guess I'm curious what your experiences have been thinking about teaching about 
Like teaching about Clinton and neoliberalism just seems so foreign to people who are really concerned about like Trump and um, and thinking about his anti-global. I mean, what what is seen as sort of anti-globalization. Um, yeah, I'm just sort of thinking through that. I'm curious how you think about teaching these longer histories within moments of such extreme change when kind of the narratives that we've been working with made a, a lot more, like my political education made a lot more sense about neoliberalism before 2016. I don't know, does that sort of make sense? That's what I'm thinking through. Hi, I'm, I'm Andy. Um, I, a lot of this discussion, I think, uh, seemed to tend towards trying to find some new stability in the in the crisis of the current era, um, and I you know I think that can be achieved, and you, you offer a you know a good vision of how that can be achieved through making the capitalist system more just, uh, making the the state more constitutive instead of the this current tend towards exclusivity, but a lot of what the what what uh, the left is today is really wants things that are far. Uh, more radical to the point that it's actually demanding the destabilization of the system by like, calling for abolishing borders, calling for uh, abolishing the carceral state. Um, and I'm wondering how this uh, emerging socialist movement can reconcile two radical di different visions of, of even what we're talking about as socialism. Um, you know, the United Front is one way to do it, but at a certain point, there's going to have to be you know, uh, some resolution to these tensions. It might be sooner than later. So I'm just asking your thoughts on that. Uh, I just want to put in a plug here. Andy Gitlitz is doing a presentation Sunday night at Vermilion, uh, 6.30, 8.30, The Secret History of Marxist Alien Hunters, the UFO <laughs> story that you, they don't want you to know. I highly recommend people to come to it. Third question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dina. I think I have a maybe a similar question, which is just how do you transition people from thinking about reforms to our current system to a replacement of our current capitalist system? Great, great, great. Okay, so um, I think that, that um, answering the first question about um, how to um, sort of how far back do you go sort of in, in, in teaching history and how do you make sense of the present? I think it's about making sense of the present. And I don't think you can understand Trump without understanding Clintonism. Um, and so, I mean, my short answer to your question is assign your students the book that we're supposed to be discussing tonight, The Old is Dying and the New Cannot Be Born because that um, is an analysis, it's not the only one, there may be competing analyses, but it's an attempt to explain why the neoliberalism that you um, were talking about and that you studied created the conditions that made Trumpism possible and made Brexit possible and made Bolsonaro possible and on and on and on. Um, I, I don't think you can understand the present without that history, and that's because it, if this is the interregnum, what is it, right? Uh, what has crumbled that creates the opening? You have to understand that. So then uh, on the, the second question, um, I feel um, very much in agreement with uh, the basic point that which I understood to be that, um, uh, that you know, there, in this time that I call it a time of, of volatility, there is a lot of searching for, you know, p visions, for perspectives, for programmatic conceptions, and, it, and there's a great deal of, uh, e even, you know, just among all of those who think of themselves on the left, a great deal of uh, confusion, disagreement, uh, you know, and it doesn't all har harmonize. We have people who are principled anarchists and we have people who are uh, communists and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and um, I think that um, it becomes very important, this is where I wanna make my, my little pitch for theory. I think it's really, really important for the left to develop what we used to call in my day an analysis. I don't know if that word rings a bell for you, but you know you couldn't get anywhere in the 60s if you didn't have an analysis. And okay, it's, it might, might sound silly, but the point is we really need at the level of basic education in the left and in everyone that we're trying to recruit some very clear 
idea of what capitalism is, which many, many people really don't have a clue about. They know it's bad, but what exactly is it? And, um, in, and, and why are the people intuit that in a time of crisis, that it's not just that we have this bad problem over here and this bad thing happening over there and this one there, that there's something underlying all of this that generates all these things, not accidentally, but because of the, the, the real deep structure of the social system. We have to teach people what the social system is. We have to teach, so give them a picture so that they can see where their problems fit within this system and why they have them and why their problems look somewhat different from somebody else's problems over there. The same system is also generating. I think this is the way you build a, an understanding of what it is we're trying to change. And then in the course of trial and error, experimentation, struggle, what works, what doesn't, you begin to actually develop a common vision. Uh, I think that's absolutely central. What was the third question again? Uh, Reform and revolution. Ah, oh, yeah, that's a good one. That's a, that's a really good one. The old classic. Yeah. So um, there's no question in my mind that what we are um, aiming for is revolution. But that doesn't mean that we what we're that the what we're thinking of is like suddenly, uh, not everybody, but but some disciplined minority of people gets up and, and storms the Winter Palace. That's not what revolution means. It means a deep structural change that is arrived at through a process of mass organization and mass protest that gets um, progressively sharpened and deepened and radicalized and becomes uh, more and more infused with this systemic sense as things go on. People don't start there. They start with specific demands that address specific experienced problems. I'm very fond of uh, Andre Gortz's idea of what he called non-reformist reforms. Then that idea is, is close to what Trotsky is, used to call transitional socialist program. And that is, you, you want to sort of distinguish between reformist claims that if they're one, tend to sort of, let's say, end a, a, a cycle of protests, shut things down, demobilize, versus those that give people um, some victories and encouragement, but also point them to a deeper issue, to a more radical need, to a, the need for a broader struggle. So I think what we're looking for, uh, as I imagine a revolutionary process, it is this process of, uh, the, of the ongoing radicalization of demands that, that occurs both through the experience of social struggle and the learning of who you can trust and who your allies are and who might present themselves as an ally but is really not. And that, you know, that the process of struggle itself is a kind of education in the systematicity of things and the need to change some very basic things as opposed to give me more of this or give me more of that or solve this uh, local issue. Well, well, I agree with, with, with everything that, that Nancy said. Well, first of all, on the, the first question, um, her, her book, her pamphlet is actually a wonderful case for the, the explaining Trump as a response to um, the policies of Obama and Clinton and, and more broadly their, their parallels, with, be it Schroeder or Blair or these other parallels internationally. Uh, but also, I think we we need to keep in mind that you know Trump hasn't is a response, but is not a break from this this system. Um, you know, a lot of these 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 things. Trump's claim to, to that he was going to break with some of these existing free trade architecture, or that he was going to break with NATO. Like a lot of these things have turned out to be just completely you know false, which of course any leftist could have told you, but but I, I but didn't seem. To, I'm sure a lot of Trump voters didn't didn't anticipate. Um, on this other question, you know, I, I do uh, completely agree that, 
that through the fight for certain reforms, we not only win good things in the short term, we not only improve the lives of, of people in the short term, which of course is extremely important, but also we build the capacities to fight for even more radical things in the future. These are the structural or non-reformist uh, reforms. I also would even go further and say that I think that the road to revolution, the road to a completely different kind of order and different sort of society isn't separate than the road to, to reforms. We're fighting for a deeper and deeper decommodifications, taking out of the market of certain social goods. We're fighting for, for stronger unions, more militant unions. We're fighting for building the capacity of ordinary people to have more, more confidence that they could, in fact, shape these, these complex things in society and they could have more of a say in civic life. You know, the aspiration that, that socialists have long had is that every cook should be able to, to govern. Um, you know, I, I see this as, as not a separate uh, road, and I see the struggle for reforms today as potentially putting us on that path, as long as we don't pursue reforms by saying, oh, we all just should sit down at the table together, let's cut a deal, let's figure out what works for the health insurance companies, what works for the state, what works for, for working class people, and let's, let's meet you know, halfway. Um, you know, that would be the type of reforms, uh, taking grassroots energy and turning it into that, that would be demobilizing. But the types of reforms that I think Sanders and Corbyn are pointing to are far more uh, radical uh, than that. And what we need more than ever is a kind of socialism, a kind of radicalism that doesn't counterpose itself to people's daily struggles for dignity and for, for justice. Um, so even though I, I believe in this kind of leap and I believe that things will happen far faster than just kind of a slow march up the field. Yesterday, I used probably an ill-advised, I forgot to get your advice on whether it worked or not, uh, kind of football analogy. And I'm a basketball fan. I'm, I'm actually uh, mortified that I don't know who won that, you know, whether, whether the Rockets or the Warriors won. Don't tell me. Um, I'll find out on my phone. <laughs> important, important playoff basketball game, elimination game today. But, but I, I said that social democracy at its peak was kind of you know, getting to the, getting to like the red zone, you know, getting to the 20 yard line. Uh, then after the rollbacks, you know, we were, we were still further along than we would have been, but we're, we're out of, you know, field goal uh, range. But, but the march up the field isn't just a slow march up the field. You're not just running the ball, getting, you know, three, four yards every time. There's occasionally really big passes and there's occasionally really big breakthroughs. Um, and I think the struggle for political uh, reform and consciousness is kind of like that. There are moments when you really leap and propel forward, uh, but we need to prepare ourselves like it's going to be a long slog, and that means building the organizations, building the infrastructure that prepares people for for spending their life uh, organizing, fighting, spending their life, you know, fighting for these daily things in their communities. Even though we both believe, and, and Nancy put it more eloquently than I ever could, that, that there's going to be um, a moment in the future when ordinary people who today don't consider themselves political are at the forefront of movements that are going to hopefully change the world. So social democracy is the 2017 Seahawks get to the red zone but can't get it in. But uh, no, I wanted to just give two historical examples for those, those questions. I want to talk about Franco Spain for a second. Franco was thought to be a fascist, but he in fact was a Catholic integralist. His goal was simply to turn... To, to turn Spain back to the Middle Ages, which is a kind of astonishing goal. And after the war, he adopted neither capitalism nor socialism, but an economic system that he called autarkia, autarky, literally cutting himself off from the outside world, going back to subsistent agriculture. 10 years of this produced absolute hunger, deprivation in Spain, and finally, uh, Opus Dei, uh, introduced capitalism in the 50s, and then Spain became capitalist. The reason I mention that is nothing like that has happened with the right. When we look at Bolsonaro or all these kind of strange uh, uh, distortions of political manifestations, every single one of them cuts taxes for the rich, uh, privatizes, deregulates. What happens at the base hasn't changed whatsoever, no matter the kind of strange, monstrous forms of political faces that they've taken in, in Trump and so forth. So uh, what we'd have to say is that, as Nancy says in her book, neo, uh, it doesn't say it quite this way, but neoliberalism is a rationality that's compatible with many political forms, but it's going to keep going on. 
So in the, the sense of how can I teach Clinton uh, when we have Trump, I think that's what you could say. And there's a very good book which I think deals with this, what he calls hyper, they call hyper-reactionary neoliberalism, uh, called Never Ending Nightmare. It's just out from Verso by Dardo and Laval. I highly recommend it. Non-revolutionary reforms, revolution, and so forth. I'm a combined and an uneven struggle guy. Uh, I have no idea what's gonna work, whether we're gonna hack our way into the future, uh, whether we're gonna make some simple demand that the system supposedly allows us to fulfill like democracy, but in fact, when you ask for it, it's not given, so people get real riled up and push it forward, or whether there'll be some moment of riot like the Gilets Jaunes. I don't really know. <clears throat> but what I do know, and I go to Chile as my example, where I was, is that someone once said to me, well, you know, there was really nothing at stake. All Andy was asking for was more democracy and a kind of mixed economy. But it was too much for the right. It was so threatening, even the most minimal demands, that their response was to secede from the system, somewhat the way that the South did in the Civil War, and somewhat the way the Republicans and capital has now. The point is, even the most minimal demand, call it a non-revolutionary reform, you know, even something that's supposedly guaranteed, is going to produce a reaction. And you have to understand that this is a dialectic, that that will produce reactions back. And so to say only that, you know, hey, we got to go after the Winter Palace, which by the way, <laughs> was, a, was kind of staged anyway in Eisenstein's film. I mean, it was all over by the time they went in the Winter Palace, but that there's some big military event that's a revolution is not true to the fact of, of what's happening. This is a process uh, that will happen uh, almost because capital is so fragile at the moment that it regards any demand to deliver anything at all as something that will give away everything. That's why Amazon slapped down the head tax. It wasn't that they couldn't afford it. It was that they thought that opened the gate. And at the end, uh, you know, this, this point where we get subsidized by the state and we don't have to pay taxes is going to end. And then we won't be a profitable company, you know? So, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about reform and revolution. Those are the cross upon which uh, the left crucified itself in the 60s and, you know, just pushed forward because we're going to get plenty of push, pushback. So that's my thought. All right, Th thanks very much. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> please, please get some of our programs. We've got a lot of good things doing. Nancy, uh, Assad is going to, I'm, I'm sorry, not Assad. <laughs> Baskar is going to be monitoring a panel uh, called Red Straight Revolt uh, on the return of the strike and working class consciousness, the teacher strike. Eric Blanc has a wonderful book about teacher strike that's out from Verso, and that's a good example of something concrete and radical that's happening now that has really expanded from uh, beyond the kind of craft union type strike. And uh, Nancy has a book on capitalism uh, where Christian Lotz is going to be part of a, the discussion. It'll be very interesting. And they're both at the bookstore tomorrow afternoon. And uh, uh, Kathy Weeks is a part of that and uh, Saad Haider. So uh, I think we've got a great program tomorrow. And uh, I hope to see some of you. And please uh, line up and buy the books. They will be signed. Thank you again for coming out this evening. Again, we do have the books over to your left if you would like to purchase one this evening. Thank you.